thank you for, for having us also here. Unfortunately, we are based in two different places. So I'm usually based in Amsterdam and Radia is over here now with us, um, but she's sitting in Egypt um, at the American University where, she, where she's teaching, actually. So she's just ending her teaching day in Cairo. Um, oh, right, okay, she was a good. Um, that happens a lot. This is quite typical for our practice, disappearing and reappearing on this special program. We use this because Skype actually doesn't work at all in Egypt, so we have to find other ways of connecting and actually speaking to each other. Hi. Okay, so I'm just going to make her, um, I'm going to make your face disappear. Bye. Um, and I'm going to switch to my presentation mode. So she's going to be with us for the presentation. Do you want to say something quick? Oh wait, I gotta plug you in if you wanna say that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. It's a bit weird. And I have a boy now. Okay. Uh, hi everybody, uh, thank you for uh, it's delaying as well. Okay. Um yeah, I will be here. Lauren, of course, will take over. So I will be here for any question later. And uh, yeah, thank you for having us. Okay. Bye bye. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's always um, okay. We can still we can still hear you. Um, yeah, it's always really uh, okay. okay. Um, Keep quiet. <laughs> um, so it's always really a great idea to use Skype and these kind of technologies, but they actually never work, right? We all know that. Okay, so the two of us together, I don't know, if you can't hear me, just give me a shout um, and I can stand. Can you guys hear at the back? Yeah. Good? Okay, so we're called Foundland Collective. We've been working together since 2009. So yeah, that is now 10 years which we consider to be a great achievement because, um, well, it's really difficult to, to work together sometimes. I think you guys know maybe from your school projects, but um, it's quite a challenge and also we are working long distance. So um, yeah, I mean, we, we, we teach as well. I'm teaching in The Hague um, in the Netherlands. I live in Amsterdam, but I travel to The Hague to teach. I've also been teaching in Amsterdam over the years. So both of us have our separate lives and then we connect uh, many times over the, the summers and we, we work on our projects uh, together. Both of us have a background in graphic design. I studied in South Africa and Ralia studied partly in Damascus and Syria and partly in um, Arnhem in uh, the Netherlands. And then we both went on to do a master education at the Sandberg Institute in Amsterdam. And that's where we, we kind of connected, um, not so much from being buddies and friends and wanting to work together, but more because we really worked on similar graduation projects and we, we thought that we have a similar way of approaching things and also thinking about our own identity uh, within the context, um, Ralea having moved from Damascus to the Netherlands and me having moved from South Africa and how do we consider our own identity within um, in this new place, the Netherlands, and that's also why we are called Foundland, because we wanted to make a space where we could really think about ideas of nationality, <coughs> identity within a kind of graphic design practice. And maybe um, we'll probably also talk more about this tomorrow, but um, uh, maybe you guys are familiar with graphic designers having their own practice being that they work on projects that are interesting for them, let's say, not just in the commission, uh, commission for clients always. And that's what we really try to grow and to think about ways of, of doing that. And um, also it's <coughs> challenging regarding money and uh, all those good things. But um, yeah, we really try to build Foundland from the perspective of doing projects that we think are important for us within this umbrella. So on foundland.info, you see here there are many different uh, projects that we've been doing over the years. You can check that out. Um, this is just one little example of a project in 2014 called Beyond Allegories, and this is, uh, yeah, you see the two of us together. We are standing here with another man, um, oh wow, it's quite pixelated there, um, called Dirk Poet, and he is the head of the Pirate Party of the Netherlands. And for this project, we were actually commissioned to work together with this political party and think about their policies. They think a lot, the 
Pirate Party about online rights, like what are our, our digital rights. And we, uh, we, we kind of took their political campaign and the policies that they were thinking about and we did a whole kind of um, speculative scenario around the borders of Europe and what were the policies in that time and we could also, in conversation, uh, be, be talk, talking to these people from the Pirate Party and we developed a whole scenario from found footage I won't go into it in detail, but um, this is us kind of prevent, uh, presenting this at the Gemeenteraad, which is like the government in Amsterdam, to actually show that this is what we think based on their policies, this is what we actually have come up with as a scenario. So these are kind of interesting spaces that we've been able to work within, um, just to give an example of how we think design can kind of interface also with the public sphere and also with a political sphere as well. Um, yeah, these are some fun images that, that we like to make. Um, every time we go and do a residency abroad, we make a little PR image for our, our residency. So this is um, a time we spent in, in Egypt. We've also done residencies in Washington DC, working with um, archives at the Smithsonian Museum. Um, and there's one from New York as well. Uh, this is also a big part of how we are operating and working is uh, the two of us go and spend time in a place and collect material and collect um, you know, conversations with people, encounters. We always have a mission in mind before we go. <laughs> Sometimes it changes along the way, but uh, this is a really nice way for us to work together and to also spend time in a, in a new place and also again thinking about identity uh, and these kind of issues, when you travel, of course, these things change and shift and it's nice to experience um, all of this together. So these, this is from many different residencies over the years. Um, and tonight I wanted to share with you three different projects. Uh, this one is, is quite an old uh, project from 2011, 2012, and the other two are a bit more recent. What connects these three projects is that all of them deal with archives in some or other way. Uh, this first one is more looking at archives of material from social media and uh, I also show a project looking more at archival um, kind of uh, more historical material and then there's another one which is a more digital archive. So Simba, the last Prince of Bath Country was a publication that we made in 2012 um, and just to give you a little bit of, of background, so <laughs> in 2011-2012 the conflict broke out in, in Syria, I'm sure you all uh, are aware of that, I hope so, and um, we started, Radia had a kind of special connection also to to what was going on there because she had been away from her country for quite a few years and she was watching how events were unfolding in Syria, but everything on social media, right? So um, for her it was really interesting to experience how her network suddenly found a kind of way of expressing themselves politically online. Because prior to this people were not even allowed to have access to social media. And if you wanted to access Facebook or YouTube, you had to actually use a proxy to be able to do that. But then, what happened after 2011 is that the government actually allowed everybody to, to use open access to, to social media, which meant a sort of strange thing happened, that everybody was using social media to actually organize uh, their protests or whatever they were doing, but at the same time they knew that they were being watched. So social media became in a place, in a way, like a place where you could uh, express yourself, which is something new also for people, but also a place where you, you know at the same time you are being watched. Um, so this was quite interesting for us to see what type of imagery was emerging on public space. This would have been typically what you would have seen in Syria and probably is still actually quite similar. Um, you have a regime that's been in place for many years, you have a father and a son who have been running the country since the early 70s and also I mean there are not so many uh, places in the world where you, where you have that actually, that it's a family who passes down the power from one, uh, uh, from the father to the son 
and uh, the myth, uh, the, the power of the, the country, how it is uh, sold in a way to the people is very strong. Right? So this has always been something that is indoctrinated on, on uh, even small school children. So this was always the narrative uh, previously and probably in the public space in Syria today, it is, maybe it has not even really changed so much. Um, but these are the sort of images that you were seeing on social media. So these are uh, images that were, were taken in 2011, 2012, when people became very excited and they, they thought like, okay, now is the time that we're going to get our freedom. Now we will just, uh, you know, protest in the street, but we'll take photos and we'll put it on social media. And this way the world will also see what we're doing. In this example here, you have a woman who were making protests in their living room. So they gather with a small group of women and they record these protests and they put them onto YouTube. So on YouTube, you have like a sort of home for all of these people singing, you know, very, very, in a way, happy and um, yeah, kind of hopeful uh, forms of protest. Of course, after a while, everything changed because it just became extremely violent after this period. But we thought it's very important to document all of these and to just at least take screenshots, download a lot of these videos because we thought, okay, it's also something special that's happening here. Um, which, by the way, a lot of these things just are not to be found anymore. So that's also quite good. Now we think like, okay, that's really great that we saved it because they are, they are not to be retrieved on uh, social media anymore. Uh, this is an image which, um, the one on this side is like an identity, a sort of a branding for something called the Syrian Electronic Army. And that was a group that popped up at the time um, and they, they were thought to make a lot of propaganda images, digital propaganda images, 2011, 2012. Uh, they were also practicing hacking, so they would hack websites and then they would put a banner that says, you've been hacked by the Syrian electronic army. But really, sort of, if you see it, you think, yeah, okay, it's a bit amateuristic style. Um, and also a bit random, who they were targeting. Uh, but this, is, this was their identity, you know, the keyboard on the arm, and uh, this was supposed to be their headquarters. So we thought maybe it's interesting to follow people who we think are making this digital propaganda and see what kind of messages they are actually introducing on social media. Of course now we all know about the troll armies and the Russian uh, trolls and all these kind of things. I think since 2011 period it became actually quite normal for us to imagine that there are a secret army of people making propaganda on Twitter or whatever. Um, these are some collections of images that we saw on social media too. This one is um, a collection of images taken by people who were participating in a protest, that they were taking small snapshots of the army that were actually uh, watching them, you know, at the protest. So then you suddenly have a small archive of people who were potentially shooting at the crowd or not, we don't know, but those people are part of the pro-regime army that were being watched actually by the protesters. And these are, are people who um, were detained or, or held in, in prison or had, who disappeared. So Facebook also somehow functioned as an archive vault because if you put things on these sort of Facebook pages, and again, they may not exist to this day, but somehow there they are kind of kept safe because if you were to put them on your website or maybe on your blog, you had the risk of being hacked. But in this sense, it's, you know, Facebook served a strange role. At the same time, it's not really secure, but at the same time, there was a lot of information kept there. And who knows what the future of these kind of images could be, you know? Maybe these people are going to be put on trial or something, you know, they, you know, they, are still in jail, we're not sure. Okay, so Simba, the last prince of Bath Country, um, the title, just to explain, so Bath Country is the <coughs> political party of Assad, so the, well, the current president. Um, and also Assad in itself means lion in Arabic. So a lot of the propaganda material and the images that we saw actually featured lions, as you see from this one, that was actually from the Chronicles of Narnia, 
like Hollywood uh, movie. Um, the lion was, was a central feature to a lot of the digital images that we, that we saw. So we thought, well, this is quite a nice title for, for the publication. And <clears throat> inside the publication, we, we put together or kind of wrapped up a lot of different material. Um, some just documenting the protests, as I've shown you, and writing about them as well. Uh, we also gathered images. So, uh, at the bottom here, on this side, you see Bashar al-Assad at the bottom. And this is a, one of these examples of the, the propaganda images that I'm talking about. But what we did was to pop them into Google image search and try and search for the images that were used to make the propaganda images. So that's what you see up there. I'll show you another example. Oh, here we go. I hope you guys can see that. Um, <coughs> So, um, this was quite an interesting experiment for us to, to play with because suddenly you see the original images before they are processed into propaganda images and it brings a whole new meaning to what that actually is. So here you have like, a, I don't know, some image from which is highly photoshopped from a game or from a, some sort of, um, I don't know, medieval... <coughs> challenge. <laughs> um, so you can, you can sort of imagine um, what the person is thinking or how they are thinking when they're making that. Sometimes the images were really weird because you have this one over here, which was actually the American army um, in Iraq. And then that was being used, the American army is being used within the image of the Assad propaganda, which in itself is like two different ideologies completely. So it was quite interesting for us to think about how, what, what's going on here? What are they thinking making these images? Um, the same again here, this very iconic American related image and how it's also used as the identity for the Syrian um, uh, electronic army again. Um, yeah, so this got us thinking about why images are used in this way and also uh, it's quite interesting to see how the internet also facilitates this kind of image making, right? I mean, it's not very new for us that you can use Photoshop to manipulate images. But somehow, uh, we wondered if the person making the image is really considering what the meaning behind that is. Um, many, more, many more images, some more religious, <laughs> as you see in this one. Um, yeah, what we also made here uh, is a, it's an interview that we scripted, which was, we, we followed, as I said, some of these people who were making images. And then we thought it would, might be a nice exercise because we couldn't get in touch with them personally to actually script an interview with them, which is fictional, but it's based on the things that we saw. So it's a conversation with an image maker. And then again, on the other side of the spectrum, like on the other side of the conflict, you also saw the same kind of techniques being used by the Syrian opposition. So this is an image of a PlayStation advertisement made in Chile, right? So a completely different uh, environment. And then that has been kind of taken apart and used as a propaganda image on this side. So to explain a little bit about what this image is, this is a famous statue that's in the center of Damascus. And because the opposition, uh, the Syrian opposition, didn't really have a leader or a, a specific person uh, to represent in their, their campaigns, they actually thought it would be good to use this statue. So this is an, a, an sort of ancient uh, ruler, Salhadin, here. And there he's coming alive to save the city. And here you see a lot of landmarks around that kind of um, reference the conflict and the different places involved. So, yeah, I mean, this was just basically a way for us to collect and analyze images, which is also something that comes back in some other of the projects. Um, this has Simba, the last Prince of Bath Country, the publication. We've also shown it as an exhibition many times. Here you see, we, we like this quite weird presentation that we did of it last year. This is at Ars Electronica Festival in, in Linz in Austria. And it was in a bunker, an underground bunker. Um, so this is just an exhibition setting. 
Uh, oops, sorry, wrong way. Um, yeah, this is to give you an idea of a video that we also made that goes with installation. You can imagine that goes on for like a long time. It's kind of like a graphic design comedy. Um, okay, next. Okay, um, so th this was just to give you an idea. That was how we also like to experiment with, okay, we show the publication, but okay, that's a video that also goes with it. All right, the next project is quite uh, serious. I can say this is uh, one of our quite recent projects, it's called Real Time History, and uh, well basically we were commissioned to for a festival and the, the theme for the festival was post-truth. So they asked us, okay based on everything that you've collected and everything that you've seen related to media, social media and what's been happening in the conflict, can you come up with yeah, something new to say about this? Um, so, so what we thought would be interesting to look at is video evidence because when you sort of see a news article like these are examples in April 2018, you often see like the same material being distributed with different articles. I think you guys have all seen this. 
and um, it's also probably these the, the video evidence is made by journalists on the ground uh, maybe they are more professional maybe they are more amateuristic you actually you don't really know who made this and also you don't really know um, yeah how it has been edited or how it, what's happened to it before it arrives here telling the story so so what we started to see um, and this was sort of like after this event happened, we started to work on this project. And uh, we, we saw the same kind of video evidence or video material appearing through numerous um, articles. This was following a gas attack which took place on the 8th or 9th of uh, April. And also the consequences of this attack meant that there was quite a, a huge amount of retaliation coming from Western countries. So this happened. Um, and then shortly after this, there was a, a meeting in the UN Security Council on the 14th of April. And then after that, they actually decided to, um, yeah, led actually by Trump and uh, by the British government and I think French as well, they decided to send rockets over and uh, show that they were not okay with the fact that this is a, a gas attack and people had been um, you know, affected by chemical weapons, which is apparently what the video evidence clearly showed. So we were also curious, like, how does that work, actually? And when you are sitting there at these kind of councils, how can you really tell what happened and what didn't happen? Anyway, this, in this case, there was a very quick reaction. Uh, there was a, let's say, a retaliation uh, response. But then later, like only a couple of months later in July, um, there was a kind of like fact-finding mission, so they went over to Syria two weeks after the, the chemical gas attack took place, and they took samples and they, they you know, did a scientific experiment, you know, experiments, or they tried to find out what exactly happened. And there's this organization called the Organization for Prohibition of Chemical Weapons, OPCW, which is based in The Hague in the Netherlands, and they actually led the whole investigation. But basically in July, they found out, okay, actually they do not have sufficient evidence to claim that that was a chemical attack. We look at the timeline of what happened and we looked back, well, actually, maybe it didn't happen. So this is something really scary, I think, for all of us looking at the news and believing what we're seeing because, well, it just puts a lot of doubt around that. <laughs> and I have to say, I'm not 100% sure exactly what happened um, to this day. But what we thought would be an interesting experiment, and we only found out about this report while we were nearing the end of this project, then what we wanted to do is, is, is to collect as much material as possible. So if we take that one particular moment in time in April, and we can maybe possibly collect all the videos that happened around this event. So if that was a really amateuristic person, uh, just with their phone videoing what happened, or if it was a news channel, etc., just like everything, just to see what's out there. So we used actually SyrianArchive.org, and uh, that's a, a website where a lot of video evidence is stored. Also, it's supposed to be verified video evidence, so it's not just you know anything out there. It's also being sort of verified that it's it's legitimate material. This is just a small selection of, of things that we found. Uh, we got really uh, crazy about this. So in total, there were 92 videos documenting chemical weapon attacks in 2017 and 18, including um, sort of the symptoms on the body, the testimonial videos of people after the attack explaining what happened, uh, injuries in hospitals, um, you know, these are the different types of videos. Then you also had Russia Today and, and other videos we also collected from some other sources as well. Um, we started to categorize all of these very carefully, looking at who the maker is, uh, when it was made, what happened, and also translating a lot of the material, because of course a lot of it's in Arabic, which of course Raleigh can understand. But we also just um, wanted to have rough translations of what happened. Uh, how many posts, how many likes, how many shares, these sort of things we were all collecting. 
And eventually we made one video from, from all of this stuff that we collected because we uh, found this guy with the stripy shirt. So he started to appear in many different videos with this shirt. Um, actually, he always wears the shirt, I think, for the last three years or so. <laughs> um, so it could be the only one he has, that's true. Um, what we found interesting about those three videos is that uh, the same small fragment of video evidence appears in all three of those videos in different ways. And all three of the narratives are different, but it's including the very same video evidence. So this case study one is called Striped Shirt, as you see there. Um, for video one, this man, you, you meet him, his name is Yasser Aldumani. And he is uh, witnessing, or not witnessing, but recording, sorry, the attack in Duma after it's just happened. That's what he's explaining. So he, it's a very short video. He goes into this basement and he films dead people. Okay, it's all very gruesome, uh, the things we saw. But he goes in and he films them. And there is not that much editing in the video, but that's all that you see. Okay, video two. Here you see a hospital, craziness in the hospital, something bad just happened. Then it cuts and you see video one inside video two. Okay, then you think like, okay, maybe it's connected. And then after that video two, you go back to the hospital. This is again in the hospital. And then video three, you see this man explaining that he was in the hospital. But then he shows you on the screen, the video one, on the screen, and he tells you that it's not true. Everything you see on this video in the screen, it didn't happen. There's no way that this was a chemical attack. Okay, so, this is a diagram. So, if you were listening, <laughs> this is video one. Okay, the video one inside video two here. And then, again, so it's... Well, you don't see it's very red here, but it's red on my screen. Um, you see how the videos are inside of each other. So, in fact, what you see first and you believe is really true, it turns out that it's also used in different ways, in different narratives. Which is probably something that we can imagine. This is video making, you know, it's uh, cinema, actually. But it was quite uh, intriguing for us to see these clear examples. So what we did is that we just wanted to uh, play these three videos next to each other and we wanted to actually comment and give our interpretation of what was happening through the video. So this is our way of interpreting actually the archive or uh, showing what we think about it as it's running. That's why it's called real-time history so we don't really edit anything, we just play the videos and we show how we uh, what we think about that. So let's see. Imam Abul, Ashara, Ashada, Yakosuf, B, Aliklur, Assam, Bilhazat, Assam, Aros, Alhia, a second him. Have the Aharian, Al Kosofila, Al Tawab, a Sufla, for Sadafam, and Nizam Bilhazat, Assam, Jerimit, Al Asar. Hm. It's just a short extract. So what you see here is um, this is Galia, who's in Cairo, this is her uh, speaking. So we literally like recorded ourselves talking about the videos and then we wanted to script in our voices next to that. I think I have another one. Just to give you an idea, what we took as inspiration for this was the graphic novel, right? How you can really play with the different frames and what you're seeing uh, to try and bring some focus on maybe the areas that you don't look at. Um, especially, for example, in the hospital, you can really look at the different people and what they're doing and usually the speed at which we watch these, <laughs> these types of videos doesn't really allow for us to look at every detail or really to slow, slow it down. Um, yeah, so 
We also present this as a, as a publication. I also have all these publications here, so you can have a look later if you want. Um, which was nice because then you have an opportunity to really uh, take your time to look at the different frames. So we really break down the frames of the video and so you have time to really look at it in a slower pace. So we, we like to think about time, huh? how time is running in the video and how time is running in the book. It's also a completely different way of looking at it. Um, yeah, can you see more of that? Also in the book we, you have the opportunity to <coughs> say where the editing is, for example, where it's cut, um, what kind of uh, lighting there is, camera, all these kind of things. Um, probably we could show much more actually, but um, these are just what uh, we decided to include. Um, yeah, so that was that project. Um, this is still ongoing for us. This is something that we really want to work on a bit further, is to work maybe with groups of people to try and think about how we can interpret video material and how it's going to be used, also potentially in courts or uh, through uh, building cases of, of you know how people get tried or you can imagine the kind of uses for these material and um, what their future will be. Uh, okay, last project. Are we all okay? Yes? Sorry, I'm maybe talking too long. Okay, so the new world. Um, this is a happier project to end with. Uh, this is something that Rale and I worked with in 2015 and 16. We spent a lot of time in... I should stop. <laughs> <laughs> Um, in, uh, we were working in an archive in Washington DC, as I said, at the Smithsonian Museum. So, uh, I don't know if anybody's been to Washington DC? Anybody? Nobody? Okay. Uh, it's a very weird place. Um, it's like a kind of Dis Disneyland. Um, well, you've seen House of Cards, right? Yes. No? Okay, you should watch House of Cards. <laughs> Uh, well, in Washington DC you have uh, huge archives, very big. Um, imagine all the archives of the United States, it's really a massive, massive um, institution they have there. Practically the whole city is just museums and archives. And we found this very small archive actually called the Alexa Naff Collection, and there they have everything that you want to know. Uh, about people who came from the Levant, so that's Syria and Egypt, uh, sorry, Syria and Lebanon, uh, the, the piece of land uh, in that area. Um, and they moved to the United States in 1800 or uh, onwards, right? So there was a lady called Alexa Naff, and in 1970, 1980, she drove around the United States with her Volkswagen Beetle, you know, this little cute car. And she was driving to, from family to family and collecting stories and photographs and documents of uh, anything that they had left over, right, from their ancestors who arrived in 1880 to uh, live in, in New York, you know, like uh, the New World, the promised land, you know. So uh, we thought this was a really nice place to start or to look in to understand what they have, what's there, and it turned out to be quite a difficult archive to navigate, exactly because everything is saved under family name. So you have no idea what's inside the box, it's just from a family, but you don't know what's inside. Okay, this is Washington Street in Manhattan. Who's been to Manhattan? <laughs> yes, okay. Um, so this is on the lower west side of Manhattan, and this is where uh, the Middle Eastern community uh, met, actually. People from Syria, from uh, Lebanon in the late 1800s, they all more or less lived in the same area, just as the Irish people, or probably the Italians, all lived in little areas inside Manhattan. So when you go there today, uh, there is not really that much to be seen from this small community that used to live there. Um, so it's this area here with the yellow mark, and here you see this one is Wall Street. You guys know Wolf we'll, we'll on Wall Street? Okay, so, um, so you can see like today this, this land is actually very valuable because it's really near to the financial district. 
But in that time, of course, probably Wall Street was uh, not such a big deal. And anyway, this was like an immigrant uh, community. So it was there until roughly the 1940s. And um, in this area, it, there were cafes where you would eat Middle Eastern food. Uh, you would smoke shisha, hookah, as you see. Uh, there was a community that was also making a lot of publications. There were writers, very famous writers, coming from this area. And they were all very active, producing a lot of cultural material. This was the area in the 1940s when it was being demolished because there was a new kind of bridge um, and a tunnel being made there. So, so the, this area then uh, actually disappeared. Uh, we went to New York because we wanted to look for this area and we had an idea like, okay, that's awesome. You know, that was a time, maybe, when people started a new life as an immigrant where they, we also knew that they were publishing a lot in their own language in Arabic. They were also developing um, printing presses and that there was a lot of cultural production coming from there. We also thought that compared to now, how you thought of as an Arab, like this kind of stigmatization that happens, especially in the United States, perhaps there was a time when that was different. So this is why we, we go there like, oh, we're going to look. Of course, we didn't really find anything. But, um, but here, this is really what we found in the end. And this is the archive. So this is Alexa Naf, the lady with the Volkswagen Beetle. And this is us. This is Shania you see there. Um, and all these boxes that we went exploring. Um, the kind of material that we found there was really varied. So you had photographs and documents and publications and also really personal diaries, in fact. <coughs> and these are examples of some of the, the publications. And this is actually an arts publication that I think was uh, published monthly. And this one is a newspaper that was published daily. Eventually, we settled on the story of these two. So, Amr and Sana Khadaj is their name. And they are singers who were traveling during the 1950s. So, imagine the time of Elvis Presley. They uh, started their journey, or they came originally from Lebanon. They went to Palestine to sing in the radio station in Jerusalem. And then eventually, they made their way and they were invited to the United States and they stayed there. But what we thought was uh, really fascinating is that they were also, they were traveling around a lot and they were singing and writing music in their own language. Um, so here you have some of their like PR material. They, uh, as you see, belly dancing was really popular then and they were really, they were promoting themselves also uh, within a, a Christian community as well because they were Christian. Um, also singing at a lot of church events. So what we wanted to do to sort of activate this material and think about what it means for, for now um, is that we, we created like gatherings of people where we would also talk about this material. So we would think, okay, a lot of people don't know that this archive exists. A lot of people don't know about the migration wave to the United States. So this was a group of people from mixed backgrounds, from Jordan, from Egypt, um, yeah, I think it's just Jordan and Egypt, this meeting. And we would talk about and tell them the story and kind of talk about music and how music has uh, changed and we listen to the music and see what people think of it. You know, sort of like an open conversation. Um, we also visited a lot of the record stores in Cairo and we went looking for the types of music that we were hearing these, the couple singing because it's a very particular type of music that they were singing, almost like a poetry that's sung. So these are also the song sheets that they used. Um, and we were also curious, you know, what it sounds like, right? Because you just see the lyrics, but you don't actually, we didn't have that much recorded material of their song material. Um, so for this video, what we wanted to do is really to kind of recreate <coughs> one or some of their material. We went to Alexandria, so this is Alexandria on the coast in Egypt, 
and we found like in the archive a small letter that says where the ship left so the ship that they traveled on left from Alexandria to the United States and we wanted to go there but we couldn't find it of course um, but we tried so this is Alexandria this is the coast there so we, we tried to kind of relive their experience um, oh, this is shifted a little bit um, this is in Amsterdam in a recording studio um, the guy at the back is, is one of our friends and he invited two other people to actually sing this material. And what we discovered is because it's a very specific singing style that they also just knew immediately how to, how to use it or how to approach the material because where they come from in Syria, um, it's very close to Lebanon where also the couple come from. So that was a really special experience. Suddenly we had these songs that were like from the 50s written and performed and now they were also finding a way with an immigrant community to, to the Netherlands actually re-singing the material again. Uh, these are some screenshots from, from the video which we eventually made. I don't have actually anything from the, the actual video material in here but um, what we try to do is to bring together the, the archival material in such a way that it told a narrative, plus also we used a kind of landscape, um, a kind of contemporary landscape, a virtual landscape uh, that we use to visit these places. So this is their life in Detroit, where they, where they moved to. Um, these are some images from, yeah, references from what was happening in Detroit at the time, and then there's kind of virtual, um, virtual Detroit in the background. Yeah, also using basically the hotels that they went to as a starting point for, for us also virtually traveling or reenacting the story again. So this is the, one of the hotels in the background where they had actually sung. Um, yeah, and then we created like this very big map, uh, which is a collage of different archives, uh, archival materials, uh, quite literally uh, collaged or cut and paste together. Also shown again with the uh, with the with video over here, and just basically showing their route and their travels across the United States. Uh, some other kind of iterations of this work, uh, these ones we called time stacks, where we, uh, we've, we didn't use a lot of the material we found, actually, so we thought it might be really good to freeze uh, certain um, ideas that we had about the archive. So this was really focusing, for example, on the back of the photographs, you know, you have small texts there, but usually you don't see them but actually they're very important because they put the narration on what's on the other side so yeah this was in a way somehow we could show uh, yeah a little bit more of the information or the background that we hadn't shown in the previous work um, yeah this one is also quite nice it's like um, the different generations so the father writing to the son and the father writing to the son, times two, uh, kind of like layered on top of each other. So letters between different generations. Yeah, that's something quite special actually that, that we could see a kind of through a little hole maybe into people's lives and what they were thinking, how they felt. They were writing very in intimate letters also to, to family members. Uh, yeah, so we made a video from this, it's, I think, um, it's around, what is it, 15 minutes long, and that video has been shown at, at many uh, film festivals, so that's been really fantastic for that story of that couple to actually spread further, and we also have made lectures where there's video material behind us, and we are, in this particular one, it's for, it was for a feminist festival, and we were, were telling the story about three females. Uh, from the archive, but we were telling as if it's I, like in the first person from us, which uh, I think was quite an interesting exercise as well, also because between the two of us, it's of course uh, somehow east, west, south, north, you know, I mean, I'm also South African, but somehow 
a white South African, that's also some kind of, uh, yeah, identity to have. And then uh, Rani next to me, and we also had to change languages during this presentation, which was quite interesting in terms of translation and then also interpre interpretation of historical stories. And what was nice about this is, is a lot of the stories of females, also activists from, say, 1930, were really relevant also still today. And this we, we, we did in Cairo. Huh? So we're talking about a Lebanese woman who was writing <laughs> novels about females' rights in 1910. And there we're speaking to an audience who are still fighting for certain rights. So that was quite amazing to experience. Uh, yeah, this is... Um, <coughs> one of the shots from that, so this is the archivist um, kind of also spreading her story with a tape recorder at that time. Um, yeah, and this is Afifa Karam actually, she is the, the author and journalist who was fighting for women to be able to choose who they could marry, which was not really normal, and I think something we also appreciate these days. You know? Um, yeah, this is just a, a screenshot from the, from the video. And more ladies. Yeah. Okay, that's all, guys. Um, that's me. <laughs> I think I've been talking for a long time. questions I'd be really happy to talk further about any projects that you I don't know if you want to ask anything that's fine I think Rani is still there hello yeah, maybe <laughs> uh, let's see she's here hi hi <laughs> there's a delay no you're a very good job oh thanks <laughs> yeah you're the only one who was watching me <laughs> like uh, so close I guess Okay, do you want to say anything? Uh, well, good job. Ah. The first time that uh, I attended the presentation. <laughs> oh yeah, no critical feedback? <laughs> no critical feedback. Inshallah. Okay. Yes, you want to say something? Add something? Uh, no, I'm... I'm, uh, I'm, I'm I'm uh, curious about questions. If anybody has a question, if someone has feedback, I don't Can I understand? Okay. Um, no, I'm just interested if anyone had a question or feedback <laughs> about projects. <laughs> I don't know. Like, uh, this is everything I think. Ah, oh, there's a question. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, oh, hi. Sorry, I was here. First of all, thank you for the lecture. It was so I learned so much and so rich in many ways. I'm super thankful. I just—it's a really specific question, but this archive that you visited in Washington, the woman was still alive. No, she's uh, passed away. Oh, yeah. Okay, okay. I thought that you were with her. Do you know what her impetus was for collecting this? Was she? Yeah, so she um, she left uh, Lebanon when she was uh, very young. Toch? Wait, what? Uh, no, she was born in the States. What was it again? She. Nadia, come on, step in. I <laughs> think <laughs> delay. Well, anyway. Uh, no, she, she was born. <laughs> no, she was born in Lebanon. But she moved when she was really I young. think she was born when she moved to the state. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So um, she didn't have so much of a connection with the place. So with Lebanon, like except through her parents, you know, this is a typical immigrant situation that you sort of live the identity, but you yourself were not really there. Um, uh, mm -hmm. Sorry, what I forgot now what I was going to say. Okay, so she was lecturing in. Um, on the East Coast in the 70s and during this period uh, 
there was some kind of political shifts and people started to um, have this idea of stigmatization towards Arabs in general. And she experienced that as a lecturer, like she experienced actually that sort of racism towards her. And so she thought, I have to do something about this because I think that people misunderstand or they don't really understand what it is to be Arab or what this identity is. So that was her drive in the 70s to do that, yeah. Thank you. It was a really, really beautiful presentation and it says so much about how you disseminate the stories that you collect and also the, the social relevance of archiving in an age where, you know, you don't know anymore what is true and what is false and, you know, the propaganda machine and all of that. I'd like to ask, when you, when the two of you decide uh, to collaborate and create something, and especially because you're dealing with either um, either with the archiving process or zooming into an archive, like it's something that's really vast. Mm -hmm. And then how do you? What is it? Do you have a criteria that you evolve over time in terms of what? Like how do you then get into the specific? You yeah. Know? Is there? Like what was it about this particular? Story. I mean, especially because you talked about how vast the archives are in Washington D.C. You know, yeah. It's like monumental, and then you choose to zoom in on this. So, what is it? Is it something about your own engagement with identity that draws you to certain narratives? Or yeah. I'm very curious. To yeah, I think you you probably nailed it right there. Like, I think it's a very personal decision, actually. Um, oh. Sorry, you say if you want to say something. My battery's actually running dead. Um, what's it? Oh, there it is. Um, yeah, I think it's a very personal decision. So with these two musicians, uh, we were like, oh, that's just like us in a way, you know. So that in that way, it was quite. It's quite random, but also quite personal. I think. Um, there are times that we get commissioned for for projects, like for example, the video evidence was really, ooh, that was really hard as well, just because, um, thanks, uh, we also watched a lot of really terrible things, and we had an intern watching terrible things with us, and Lindsay, well, no, Dana was watching all those videos with us, and it was, that was really, I mean, you also feel very horrified even seeing all of this, you know? And trying to understand what it all means and then that's why it's sort of like uh -huh, strappy shirt like you know like some kind of comedy in the whole thing I mean it's sort of a personal quite random choice I think although something that we think has a relative or a relevant sorry story attached to it um, yeah I think it's quite personal Rana do you want to add something to that um. Well, yes, I think it's it's personal and sometimes it's uh, by coincidence as well. Like, um, I think we we leave ourselves a bit free from um, like what to do next. Like, um, I think all our projects are connected somehow. Um, so we started with um, uh, Simba, and Simba led us to another kind of investigation. Um, so all the projects are connected. But it, it makes sense for us, but maybe if we not, not because we also try to. Um, I think what we learn from working with archive and collected material is to make this choice: um, where, uh, what are the selected um, material that we want to work on now? Because you cannot really show everything, um, and sometimes you can reuse. Um, uh, those kind of material to tell another story in another um, in, a, in a different direction. So sometimes you really need to make those choices that I need to select one story to be able uh, to direct um, the project or to to make a conclusion in the end. Um, so yeah, this is why sometimes now we are working on a project that we start collecting in 2014, but in 2014 we didn't have enough material or we didn't know exactly what to do with the material, but we knew it's important, so we are going to tell the story later. So, so this is how, how we work. Um, 
Yeah, yeah. I, knew, I knew you would say that. Yeah, well, of course. <laughs> yeah. Um, so this is the project that she's talking about. And uh, this, we've, this material we've been collecting since 2014. This is something we just, uh, we just published. So I did, we didn't have it in the presentation now, but it's the story of people's homes that they left behind. But it's like over time. So we started with this in 2014, and now it's like still continuing, and we collect everything in here. So if you guys want to have a look, you're welcome. Um, yeah, it's just like a uh, quite simple idea, like asking people to draw their home that they left behind. But we have now translated uh, versions of these. And um, yeah, it's kind of commemorating and preserving those memories. Um, and then, yeah, we also took the opportunity to write a bit more about that, thinking about what it means to, how architecture affects memory and recollection of memory, which I think is a really interesting topic, um, especially for the architects out there. Um, and uh, yeah, so for us, this was sort of like a basic, like a really personal thing, actually. Ask your friends to draw their house. Yeah, that's like kind of fun exercise that everybody should try out. But then, yeah, after time it has a bit more relevance actually because people probably won't return, probably the houses are not there anymore. Yeah, and with time everything changes. Yeah, so that's that. Mm -hmm. um, you, you... Want to continue? <laughs> <laughs> I forgot. I forgot what you were saying. <laughs> oh, yeah. I think like in most of the projects I saw when he presented today, they are located in specific geographies, hmm. which are obviously closer to the culture of the one of the geographies. Yeah. So I was wondering how comes that he's specifically focused on these territories yeah. on the one hand. And on the second hand, um, please correct me if I'm wrong, I think only one of these speak right? right? Yes. So how is it for you browsing through like the archive, for instance, and reading or like looking at these postcards and letters? And also to look at the video, not knowing what people say in real time of history, like in the first place. Yeah. How this process maybe influence also the way how you work together. Like I think you will. It's difficult to unlearn reading. So when you look, yeah. or like when Galia looks at a letter, she will immediately get the content. Yeah. And you look maybe on like other parts of it. So what yeah. how this influences the cooperation? Yeah. Did you hear that? <laughs> Uh, not so much. Yeah, okay, maybe. Okay. <laughs> I'm maybe. wondering if I should make her uh, answer. Um, no, but yeah, that's true. So, um, yeah, like I explained, we also started to, for example, with the Simba project, which is now quite old. From from that perspective of, like Raleigh's pers perspective, actually, like witnessing the the conflict as it's unfolding uh, from our position in the Netherlands um, and then everything is kind of like yeah translate or my interpretation is like translated through her that I mean translation becomes a huge uh, thing that we work with in general and that's also why I think you see the tendency to to really think about and then analyzing something and interpreting something and translating it at the same time. For example, in real time history, it's like translation and interpretation simultaneously. I don't know if you, you don't really see it maybe, well, yeah, you see it in the parts I showed you. So the guy is speaking Arabic and then the text is like translating what he's saying, but it's also interpreting what he's saying simultaneously. So yeah, I think this is a big, part of it, and people always ask me this question, right, especially if I'm like alone, they're like, why are you, white woman, focusing on these topics? And it's always sort of like, well, yeah, but it's also, I mean, it's how the collaboration has evolved in a sense. And we like from project to project that it really builds on the sort of ideas that are not only really related to that content, but that are also quite universal. Huh? Like the desire for mm -hmm. an immigrant not to be stereotyped, the desire for utopias of a way of places to be free to, to 
uh, also to work through guilt. I mean, being a white South African, that also comes with the baggage, is like guilt of what happened before, guilt of what your parents never did before, etc. So it's also kind of like these more general topics that also, I think, come come back. Um, do you want to say something? Mm. Okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> No, it's, it's also, um, I think in all our projects, if you had the time to read maybe more and to go in depth, it's sometimes very difficult if you do, do this presentation where you like have a preview of like project one, project two, um, that actually what we, what we are talking about, it's uh, um, image production in specific narratives and specific contexts. So now, yes, we are using the study case of Syria. It's happened because it's um, it's there. It's um, kind of um, provoking us to to look at, at it as a study case, and it's because also like giving us so many examples uh, in a very quick changes also in uh, related to image production. So when we started with Simba. We were not, of course, those images uh, have a like, kind of a political context related to what's happening there, but also you could apply this case into all kinds of uh, propaganda production. Uh, how we actually now um, see those images, um, how we identify the source, um, what does the, uh, this new images, um, how they connect to the, the, to the old um, meaning of the source of of the old image after before manipulation and after manipulation so all these kind of questions that we try to to answer through our research are quite universal so it's not really um, specifically connected to the syria case um, we also try to um, um, yeah maybe extend our uh, borders by um, investigating like uh, also go through time because like in uh, um, the new world for me also I didn't know about the Syrian community in the United States where you could also like consider me as a, a complete ignorant to that kind of uh, archive the only difference that I have uh, or like the only advantage maybe I have in Lauren that I could read the language, but I really didn't know anything about it. It was a completely unknown for us. We don't um, read about it in our history. We it's so disconnected. So it was uh, kind of important to go through this journey together, I think, um, and also discover it together and discuss it together. Um, yeah. Yeah, but also for, for real-time history, so I'm just not thinking, um, for real-time history, like you guys also watch, look at The Guardian, right? And you see those videos too, of whatever chemical weapon event happened or whatever kind of event. And it's also a matter of yeah, kind of translation and interpretation of that material now. And I do think it's important that people think about those issues in general. Um, you know, like, because it's it's part of our global culture, actually. Like, it's also things that we all see. I mean, yeah, sorry, it's just another thought. Yeah, and also it's interesting when uh, I look at a video that I understand its language, I focus on specific things because I understand what has been said. So my, my relation to the image is completely different than you and uh, when also Dana was looking at the video. So... Um, like looking at it separately and taking notes and then sitting together and see what we actually understand by this image, what did we focus on was also like quite interesting because um, then you understand the power of language and uh, not only language, the, how actually comfortable the person was, how confident he was telling this, you know, like you can as you understand the language, you can like understand completely different nuances in the, in the, the video that actually someone else um, cannot really feel or understand and how this connects to the background of this story. Um, so th those kind of things I think it's, it's very um, useful that you work with the team to make like a, a, the most objective analysis to what you are really looking at. Hmm. Yeah. 
something very bad happened and people died in a way that is just really horrifying because that's also um, you you don't think it's really possible that that kind of death can be faked that's kind of like maybe the human in me thinks that but maybe it's possible like I don't know I don't know because you see people dying in such a way that it's it, it's apparent that there's not a lot of blood so it's not a big explosion or it's not a gun you know, it's something else has happened there. We were not really looking for precisely what happened or what was true and what was not true. Mm -hmm. It was more about looking for the different types of things that were created or the different types of image, image production that came out of this particular event. So you have other groups that are really specialized in looking at you know, what exactly happened from a journalistic perspective, like Bellingcat, I don't know if anybody has heard of them, are really specialized in doing this. And in fact, they have worked on this case quite extensively, and they, um, in their report, say it definitely did happen. So what they would then say is perhaps like the Russians cleaned it up afterwards so that it didn't look like there was a, an attack. But, yeah. Uh, it's also, yeah, what do you want to see there? That's also another question, which is maybe too complicated to think about now. But you can also, you know, you can also see that from, from, from that perspective. Like, if you believe that it happened, probably you could create the, you know, kind of see it in that perspective. But it definitely is very alarming. Uh, to understand that you don't really actually get to the bottom of it by the end of looking at all this material. So that's why I think it's also fascinating to try and think about what is, how is that video material going to be used in the future? Because I think it's a very new field um, and we also don't, don't really know too much about it yet. But as I say, we like to, we're busy with a funding application actually to try and look at some other case studies or just go a little bit further but then again from our perspective as image makers and as image um, yeah kind of people who are interested in interpretation of images yeah do you have anything no I think uh, yeah I think you said the most important point that our goal is not like finding the truth because we are not uh, we are not journalists, we are not investigators in that sense. We are also not a legal investigator. Um, but yes, I think we, as an as image producer, we could um, analyze images in a way that um, it could make sense or we could maybe um, expose specific pattern also in image production question why the image is produced in this way, why this edit is happened in this way, um, why there is color corrections in some of the footage, why why it's cut here and edit, you know, like all these kind of things we could notice and maybe a general public don't see because they focus on the main story, uh, the red line of the, of the video, so they don't, they don't really pay so much attention to all these details, but those details actually kind of the blueprint of this footage. And what does it mean if this footage become a, an evidence in court? Um, what does it mean when, uh, when we know that there is so much money spent by NGOs to train young people to be um, citizen journalists? So what, what kind of citizen journalists we are talking about if they produce those kind of material? Um, do we need to discuss different methods to make this footage extra clear or um, easy to verify? Um, uh, do we need to uh, actually give the raw images, um, uh, find a way to upload the raw images? Like, of course, those um, activists, they use social media like you, 
Facebook to upload this material and then activist group download it from YouTube. So YouTube also have its limitation for how long the video is and the quality of the video. Um, the internet speed also like um, determine what kind of footage we get or how, how HD or uh, low quality. So all these kind of things are um, subject for investigation. Um, from the point of view of an image production and what, what the future of this, if it's going to end up in court, then we really need to uh, take it seriously uh, from the moment of production till the moment of analyzing, uh, regardless what the footage is and mean. Do you guys have any other questions? Oh, hey. um, um, so, like, in the last years, a lot of projects focus on Syria, um, uh, on the history and the present time in Syria. And um, you exhibit or you show the projects, like, most of the time in a cultural context. Mm -hmm. So, um, I'm, like, I'm wondering, what do you think, or, like, how does how do you projects like take part in a larger political or civic discourse of the Middle East? Like, yeah, what is your role? In this? Yeah. Uh, okay. okay. You want to go first? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it's not maybe having impact at the moment on the larger scale. Uh, no, maybe, I, um, I think yes, in a way. Uh, no, I think, I think that... Uh, not in Syria, for example. For sure. Not in Syria? Not in Syria. No, yeah. no, no, yeah, okay. um, maybe in Syria. Yeah, no, I think that um, this is also for us, I have to say, a really a reason to be involved in education as well. Because I think that... <laughs> Um, yeah, what we can bring is a kind of critical thinking about what's happening around us. So this is something that we put into our education practices. Uh, yeah, I mean, for Alia, I know it's been a challenge because she started teaching in uh, Cairo like 2000, maybe 14, 15, something like that. And then you come into programs that are quite traditional, uh, you know, the 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 scope of graphic design is not necessarily uh, also focusing on critical thinking and um, yeah, w you know how a designer can practice further than, than just an advertising agency or whatever. Um, and I think that, that for us is probably the domain at the moment where we have most impact, I think. Talk? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so, <laughs> so, no, because what we just saw, which was really lovely as well, is that we went to present actually this uh, book project at the Amman Design Week. So this is also again a project that we've initiated. We've created a publication and some um, models. We presented there, but also Raleigh has been teaching at the. Um, American University and her students have also uh, been participating with similar kinds of projects also reflecting on society issues and they are also now showing their work and thinking about redesigning medical gowns in, in Egypt and you know having kind of like a focus on more socially related issues. So I think also just because of time and that's not that we don't want broader impact but I think that that is really where the impact is at the moment in the Middle East specifically because I think it's something also quite new for the design field um, and even the arts field as well probably. Uh, having said that, I think with the Real Time History Project, like we really would like to take that further. And um, we are in touch with a group of um, a Syrian organization in Amsterdam and they're also quite keen to, I didn't tell you this yet, they're quite keen to um, participate also in the image analysis and, and looking at images and then seeing how they would interpret them. So that's young, young, young guys, uh, say immigrants, I mean, or it doesn't really matter, whatever, Syrians living in Amsterdam. Um, so, so this is also, I think, very on a very small scale how we could possibly broaden the research projects and take them a little bit further to different communities. 
So that's something we're interested in. But I mean, honestly, you know, classes to teach and stuff doesn't give us so much time to actually do that for me. So, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. And I was curious yep. about your relationships or your contact with people that appears in your archive because sometimes maybe the archive from the United States is sold so you maybe cannot be in touch with them. Mm -hmm. But for example this this new one I yeah. think it's with people you're engaged with. Yeah. And so what is your you think you should be in touch with them or it's better to be a objective archivist? I don't know what's your relationship Yeah yeah that's a good question. Um, for example, with the, the archive in Washington DC, like we contacted the daughter, the only living child of the couple, and we spoke to her about it and she was she just loved it. Oh yeah, that's amazing. You know, like we were so happy. Um, so that was really cool that we could have that that personal contact actually, because yeah, it's it's a sort of weird, right? Working with somebody's personal material um, and maybe scripting it in such a way that they would not like or it's not true or whatever. So that was quite important and actually a lot of things that we thought or assumed were kind of were true, in fact, and she confirmed it. You know, but she told us a lot of information. Um, but as for this publication, uh, these are mainly like friends and family also. So, actually, over this summer, uh, a story that happened in, in Radia's family as well, we also recorded it and we experimented with voice recordings and so on. So, I think then, again, the personal approach really comes into it that there's also, that's nice to work with almost your own material. Um, and then it becomes something else. It's not somebody else's story as such, but it's more a way of processing really bad things that happened by telling the story. Um, so this, yeah, this particular instance was something that um, Ralia's brother, ha it happened to him, so he told the story and then she told the story to me and then we wrote the story again. Like it went through a whole process of uh, translation. Uh, so I think that in this case, it's not, we don't see it actually really objectively. And actually, yeah, coincidentally, I also know a lot of people because we were with them in the United States, we were with them in Dubai, whatever. I, know, I, I also even know a lot of them personally, so it doesn't really feel that distant. I don't know if that really answers your question. It just yeah, depends I was on. I just curious about yeah. this relationship because maybe when you, you have to start an archive, it depends, of course. If it is an old archive, so it's just going to be. Discover, or if you want yeah. to build an archive from zero to yeah. maybe you should be more involved in things. Yeah. It was just yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, it was really useful for this project to spend more time with somebody when they were drawing. Um, so there's a guy, the one who was singing in the band, like the one in the back that I said, so he, we could spend more time with him, so he really wanted to draw the house really like perfect, so we had to like, okay, draw it, and then, oh, mistake, okay, start over, like, oh, takes like three days, um, and then telling stories again and again, and then he told stories, for example, and then we were recording it, and then we asked really specific questions about what we did yesterday, okay, yesterday you told blah, 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 tell again, I want to hear it again. And in this way it was a really big process, also quite traumatic for him to tell to tell the story, but it was really nice to be able to have that time with the person. So in a way I agree with you 100% like, um, or I don't know if that's what you think, but I think it's what you think, um, is that you should have a personal engagement with the material and or it is definitely in your advantage to get some depth uh, or to understand it from all different angles <laughs> is to really have a personal connection to the material. That's true. But yeah, it could it could uh, appear as if there is no connection. You know, when you see it now, ah, do they know the people or not? Yeah, it can appear like that. That's true. No, no, I yeah. wouldn't say that could be appear. It's just 
Yeah, no, but because people, no, but people ask that question, like, what right do you have to put other people's personal house in the book? Like, you know, so it's a, it's a valid question that comes up. Yeah, that's true. Okay. It's um, a fancy something. Yeah. Like, it's, it depends on what kind of uh, material you're collecting. Like, now we are collecting material from people that are uh, living around us. And of course, not really ask someone to draw something so personal and uh, so also like painful memory and then just take it and go away. They, they also don't, uh, you need to build like this kind of trust. So most of the people we worked with, they, uh, um, they trusted us, they also spent time, uh, and they wanted also to tell the story in this way. Like we don't really enforce them to say something that they don't want to say. It's a kind of um, a discussion about what for them home was, and uh, of course for them it's like um, it's just a drawing. But for us, the collection of drawings, so not the individual ones, say so much about how those people, how how each of them has a kind of individual perception of what home was. Even all of them, they share this kind of style of the ground plan. They, they draw the ground plan, but some of them share some information. Some of them say nothing. Um, some of them draw a moment in time in their childhood. Some, some of them uh, draw a recent um, event. So for each, each one of them um, has a different kind of interpretation of our question to draw this home. Um, so it's also like for us as a exercise with um, with Ira when we went to DC uh, that we started to puzzle with the with this everything. So like oh the image and then you see yourself making. Um, collage of the timeline where, where this image belonged to exactly you know and then after we met the daughter of the couple we discovered that we romanticized actually the story of the couple because you have kind of um, cut pieces of the life and then you try to make sense of it um, but for her what but for us what, like uh, super extraordinary for, was like her parents, so she was also surprised, like, why do you think my parents' story is so special? Um, she didn't even know that actually um, the, this RF exists. She didn't know that we know her parents. So, um, yes, and she told us so many information that we were really, like, sad after, because we <laughs> for us, they were like kind of. Uh, we imagine them having like a really long, happy life, but end up uh, not like. Um, but uh, this also uh, gave us an idea that what we see now in archives, what we what we read now as history, is not completely the truth. It's a kind of uh, also imagined narrative from the collector himself or the or the. The one, who, the archivist, but also the people who who write about this collective uh, or this archive. So it is also our interpretation of the story. So it is not completely the truth. It's um, it's our personal perception of what we found and what we want to tell. So this is also we, we are aware of that in in each one, and the uh, the connection with people is part of it as well. Like um, we cannot tell more than what they want to tell us and to they need to trust us all um, to tell the information. Okay. I think we can continue maybe to the yeah. formal part of the evening or other yeah. any other questions. It's late. Thank thank you I, yeah, no, I want to thank you guys. Thank you for your attention and for all being here. And I'll see you tomorrow. Well, I see lots of you tomorrow. Okay, awesome. Okay, exactly. cool. Awesome.